and welcome to The Shakedown, where we t- talk about criminal justice from the inside out. I am your host, Rainforest, a.k.a. Ryan Forbes. I have spent six years in a Texas prison or in multiple Texas prisons. And um, during that time, I studied sociology, specializing in so- social welfare, and was cooped up um, with this guy, Malone. Um <laughs> And who are you, Malone? I am Aaron Malone. I am a uh, a, a uh, biologist. That's <laughs> I studied uh, gang behavior in the wilds of uh, both Borneo and Sumatra for over thirty years. <laughs> ah, yes, and by. Uh... I by, am by, the by, unknown Jane Goodall of orangutans. Yes, yes. Um, and by studying orangutans, he means that he was locked up in prison for 30 years and um, has recently got, uh, gotten out alongside me to uh, to talk to people about these issues with prisons, a.k.a. orangutans. So... <laughs> Um, so, um, we, one thing I was thinking today that we were going to talk about is, um, you know, I, uh, as Malone had said just before the show is that I can defend, uh, you know, prison abolition and what we should do, um, you know, why we shouldn't have prisons and what we can do instead of having prisons, um, at the drop of a hat because it's something I've had plenty of time to think about and plenty of time to plan out. But the question is, is that can you, the listener, do that? And um, so Malone and possibly our buddy Dave, if um, he um, if he has time. Forgot to introduce Dave. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Dave, um, yeah, Dave, he, Malone is actually live from Dave's new place. Um, and he, but, uh, yeah, we will see if we can get Dave on the show here, uh, here soon. And we can hopefully have some more inputs, um, as this goes on, but we figured we'll get started while, um, Dave is Kate taking care of some of his business because this is his day off and he deserves some time off to Dave's self. So Malone, go oh, ahead. We got What's that? All right. Well, no, uh, no, I was just saying, yeah, we got an earful about that from Dave. Um, <laughs> yes. We've been getting an ear. We haven't quit hearing about it yet, as a matter of fact. But, uh, all right, well, first question first. So you advocate uh, not only uh, prison abolition, and, and but so you, you actually re- advocate reintegrating dangerous criminals back into society. So let's talk about that. Why, I mean, Simple justice dictates that if someone takes a life, that he should receive a life. He shouldn't be let out of prison. The rest of his life is then forfeit. How do you justify, you know, letting someone like that go? I mean, they don't they deserve to spend the rest of their life locked up? Don't they deserve all the torments and tortures that uh, the Texas prison system can bestow upon them? Well, that's so. So that's something. That question is basically it's saying that yeah, they de- they deserve it. So it's not just really it should go to its logical end. And a lot of times I do argue that with people is if someone takes life, then why don't we just kill them? Why don't we just have capital punishment? Because honestly, if you're going to put if, – if you feel if – you, if that's how it works, if you take a life, then you have to be removed from society forever. Then putting them in a cage in a horrible – like in the place that what prison is – that's still taking away their life. That is still – you're still taking away their life. You are just – you're just doing it in a different way. It is still a life punishment. It is still a – I feel a capital punishment of um, taking their life and you're just – but not only are you um, – are you killing them, but you are basically having the taxpayers pay for their lifetime sentence in there. Now, neither of those – are good. None of, neither killing them right away, just taking out a gun and shooting them in the head right then and there is a good thing, nor is uh, is having them locked away. What 
the ideal should be is what a lot of people think that prison is right now, which is you go in here and you get rehabilitated so that when you get out, you're ready to be reintegrated with society. Now, the question is, is how do we do that? If we were trying, if, if throughout the entire lifetime of prison, we had been like figuring out what does it take to take someone who was callous enough or had enough problems in their life to take a life, um, take someone else's life, and what does it take to reintegrate them back into society, we'd be pretty good at it. We, we as a society would be good at rehabilitating them and then getting them back into society. But that's not what we've been practicing. What we've been practicing is let's throw them in a box and forget about it um, and not and never think about it again. And before that, it was let's hang them, let's stone them, let's let's kill them in a different way. Let's you know, let's set them on fire, let's drown them in a lake. You know, if you know some if a crime occurs, lock them in the dungeons. But none of these are helpful to society because as as awful as anyone, like everyone does awful, hurtful behaviors. Um, and murder, murder, and I, we can go on murder, robbery, and you can go down the whole list of awful behaviors that you can go into prison for are awful behaviors. But everyone has awful behaviors they've done that have hurt other people because of their actions. Um, just the list that we have on the law books are what you go to prison for. The question is, is how do people learn how to deal with bad behaviors? And it's not really us as an individual person. It's how do we as society deal with it so that we can move forward? Is that does that work, Malone? Did I address did I address the issue? You address the issue, but in, in a certain sense, you kind of uh, at the very beginning of it, you really kind of made the argument of someone who's uh, pro death penalty and said, you know, you know, uh, okay, well, yeah, I agree with you. We shouldn't put them in prison. We should just go ahead and kill them. I and I want to be very. We don't have to. Yeah, no, I want I, I want to be clear about this this thing about the death penalty too, and I want it. I I get nervous about that, but I want want to. I, um, so we've talked on this show and we've even talked on the prison show in Texas, uh, on te in te actually, no, you didn't, you weren't there for that conversation. It was just me. Um, so uh, when I was on the, rub, rub it in, Randy, rub it in. I know. Well, we can get, they want you on, so we can get you on and we can talk more. So I can, I, we can always make that arrangement. Um, so when, um, so when I talked to them, I, I said explicitly that a lot of times, a lot of things, a lot of progress is not made in prison reform because we focus on the death penalty. And what I did at the beginning of that argument was to make it, and what, and what I try and do, and I know a lot of people won't hear it this way, but I want to make it clear, is that the death penalty is just as bad as life in prison. So... Time, years of life spent in prison is the same, is just as bad as the death penalty. It is still, they are both morally wrong. So there, so the, the problem with focusing on the death penalty is there's when when people focus on the death penalty, which there are so many groups, they're like, let's end the death penalty. We need to end the death penalty. Let's get rid of it. Which in Texas, the death penalty was ended, and then they brought it back. And then now what they do is this game where they they don't people protest and protest and protest and protest, and then they get one person, one inmate. There's Texas is. Texas has a bigger prison system than most countries, and they get one inmate, and they don't get him released. They just get him off death row, and that's it. And that is considered a victory, which is, to me, crazy. It's, it's, th this is, it's still morally wrong to have 
all these inmates in these prisons at the same time. So death penalty and prison colonies, all bad. <laughs> They're all prisons, all of it. It's it's bad. So the point I'm trying to make is whether you pull that that lever on the electric chair or stick the needle in their arm or pull the lever on the gas chamber yourself, um, it if you want someone to go to a prison, that is just as bad because they're both morally wrong. And the difference is, is that if you fight to get rid of prisons, then you by default get rid of the death penalty. So you should always fight to get rid of prisons. The death penalty will go along with it. And really, the death penalty will leave faster because they'll make that as a concession. That's an easy concession for them to make they, because they don't. They need inmates in prisons to sit there for years on end because we're slave labor and inmates are free slave labor. Products are made in the U.S., shipped all over the states. You would not have judges' chambers that are made out of this fine wood with leather upholstered furniture without inmates making that. Inmates make all of that. And you and so you have to have you have to like so they will happily get rid of the death penalty if they can keep inmates in prisons making all of the all of that stuff for for free. Really, for just for the price of housing, which is for is cheap, which is what slavery is, right? All right. Well, what about you? Your, um, I hear your your uh, argument about rehabilitation versus life in, life in prison, but certain you're not going to advocate that that that. Um, Criminals just be let go. That they, that uh, okay, you commit a murder. Well, you know what? You know we're not going to do anything to you at all, but put you in some kind of class. I mean, how is what you're advocating any different than a prison? So what I'm advocating for is different because I have actually experienced before I went to prison. I went to treatment, and treatment is like the polar opposite of prison, even though a lot of the steps are the same. In both prison and in treatment you're removed from society. Um, in both treatment and prison, you have like a set sentence that you're that you're going there for. In both prison and treatment, you have people there constantly monitoring you and keeping tabs on you and constantly keeping track of you. And, and there's measures there to keep, to make sure you stay where you're at. All of those are both in prison and treatment. The difference between prison and treatment is the goal. The goal of treatment is to get you rehabilitated. The goal of prison is to keep you in prison. The, the officers at a prison, like, and you see it painted on the walls. Security is our priority. Like it's let's like I can't remember what it says, but it's like security written. Security and, is not convenient. Security is not convenient, yes. And it says that all over the place. Nothing in prison is convenient. Nothing. And in treatment... It used to be secure, I mean, for the longest time. They... Anything that any, that they wanted to do in TDC, all they had to do was claim there was a security issue. And that's what they always did. They, if they confess, I mean, if, if uh, the Jews in prison wanted to wear yarmulkes, they claimed, oh, it was a, it was a security issue why we couldn't wear our yarmulkes because... By wearing a yarmulke, you can somehow escape from prison. Are are, are they really good when they said that you could hide contraband under your <laughs> under your yarmulke? This this and, right here. At both. which we told them, look, we, we have no problem lifting up our yarmulkes. You can see that there's nothing underneath the yarmulke other than our heads, you know. But they, you know, it didn't matter. You know, they, all they had to do was say say the word security, and it cleared them of whatever. I remember that one time. Uh, a guy I know had his uh, prayer book confiscated in the hallway. His his sitter, his Jewish prayer book, uh, a book that was sent into prison, passed through the DRC, the 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 uh, TDC's uh, 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 censorship pr uh, uh, 
people that that judge books whether or not they uh, they're allowed to be in prison or not came in through the mail room legally and was given to him and then some warden walked through the walk down the hallway seen it in his hand said let me have that he looked at it one time and, and then confiscated it and so the issue was then brought so you know of course we we uh, filed grievances we went to the chaplain you know like what, you know why was our why was this book taken what sense does it make so they went to the warden about it and the warden said I couldn't understand the Hebrew words in that book. Therefore, it was a security issue because I didn't know what was written in it. And for all I know, it was a book on how to make bombs, <laughs> even though he gave it back. And so when we gave it back, we were like, well, did you learn to read Hebrew or something in that in that period of time, in the, in the couple of weeks that you had this book? Right. And now, you, you're, now you're pretty uh, confident that it's not a bomb-making book? You know, you know but it, it, the point is, is that they just used that as a catch-all. It was, it was a... It didn't matter what it was; they could get away with whatever they wanted to do by simply uttering the word "security." Uh, since the prison, the the the, the uh, what is it? The uh, inc- the the uh, Priya? No, not Priya. Uh, that's what's coming Texas to mind. Texas Seven. No. no, it's the uh, the dang it uh, the uh, religious institutionalized people, whatever, you know, uh, the R- rule plus stuff, the, uh, religious freedom and institu- institutionalized per- people's act or something like that. And, you know, I think it was something, it was like signed way back in the nineties and it took, uh, nearly 30 years for the, for what it was signed in the law to actually accomplish, which was to allow people like Jews that weren't being given their, their basic, Religious rights, the right to wear a yarmulke or to grow a beard in prison to practice a religion. And and um, since then, they haven't been able to simply claim, you know, security anymore. Beards quit being... And it was so funny, because all these decades that they said that a beard is a security issue or a yarmulke is a security issue or something like that, and that's why they can't let you do it. As soon as they allowed it, it was just like a poof. All those things went away, and everybody was, and we're, we're, you're living normal life, and there was never, ever a concern to begin with. It was almost like it never, ever wasn't that way. Very, it, very y- yeah. surreal situation. That That is, yeah, it is, like I was about to say, too, while you were talking, I was like, these beards were considered a security risk and all of that as well. And it's, and, yeah. and so, like, what we were talking about, too, before was... Like I said, in prison, it's all about security. In treatment, it's all about rehabilitation. I've watched people throw chairs across the room. I've watched people make direct threats in treatment. And no one was handcuffed. The police were not called. It's because it's about figuring out how to deal with this situation and like and get everyone um, rehabilitated. Now, I will say, like, if something, there were eyes. But still, people are still people are locked behind. Uh, yeah, they're still locked. They're locked away in some kind of facility. They're they're not allowed just to walk back into society whenever they want to. I mean, there's still keys and locked doors and security measures and so forth. Else, in, in your uh, scenario, right? Right. We're not. We are not part of society. When when all of that went down, when the chairs were being thrown and all that kind of stuff. We were not in society, but at the same time, I slept on a bed at night. I went to in a to sleep on a bed, whereas in prison, I slept on a potato sack full of asbestos. Like it's a very different thing. I had pillows, I had blankets, I had um, whatever I needed. I dressed in free world clothes. All right, it there is no. Um, I was not required to have my beard, like no one was checking to my beard to make sure it was, you know, so many inches long. No one was, was doing any checks like that. I could wear my sunglasses, you know, on the basketball court or whatever. It, it doesn't, they, they don't care about that. They care about rehabilitation. You are separated from society, but you're separated because you need to work on yourself, which is, that is an entirely different perspective than you're separated from society because we're afraid of you and we're afraid of what you're going to do. And, um, and that's the problem we have. If the goal and the thing is, is not everyone I, and to be 
100% fair. The way, even the way it's set up with treatment, people left and then they started using again. All right. They got out the door and then they, they wanted to go celebrate finishing up treatment by getting drunk or high or whatever. And it's not that we have this thing down. It's it's not down pat to a science, but we also we don't do it on the scale that we incarcerate people either. We're not trying as hard as we have have been with prisons. And um, it's if we actually went and legitimately try to like if that's our goal if we put as much effort to figuring out how can we rehabilitate people and get them to a better place um as we do trying to keep them locked in these awful 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 places which the majority of the people who are locked in these places are going to get out and after being traumatized by these places are probably going to end up doing something worse because I tell everyone all the time. That, that, leads, that segues right into my next question. Right. Go. Yes. Uh, well, I'll say they're probably going to end up doing some something worse. And um, go ahead, Malone. Yeah, just go. Yeah, go. Go ahead with uh, the okay, next well, question. The next question I would have then is is like you just said. There's people that go through treatment and it does not have its desired effect, and they get out and they immediately start using it again. I mean. If you put that into the scenario of someone, once again, who's committing violent crimes, somebody else, that leads to the potential of someone else getting hurt again by those people. I mean, is that really a risk or a gamble that, that, that you'd be willing to take? I mean, I'm, you're, are you really thinking, thinking this through and that someone could just manipulate the system just in order to get out and hurt someone else? So we love to talk, especially the people who support prisons, love to talk about the founding fathers and what they believed in. And one of the things the founding fathers truly believed in, especially when it came to prison, was that uh, better that 10 guilty men go free than one innocent man be locked away. And I'm not even taught, it's not necessarily about innocent man. It's, it's about the fact that if, there's one person who can get out and do something good with their life after having done what they did, then like there's there will be mistakes made by any system. There's mistakes made by this system. But that's the point is like that's that's really the bottom line. We're already letting people out and they're causing harm. So so you can just eliminate like, well, what if? Someone else, like, are we putting someone more at risk? No, because there's, we're already, when you go into a prison, you're more likely to do harm when you leave it than when you entered it. So we're already making a place that creates crime in, in the free world. And not only that. Do you know any, any statistics that, that would um, back up what you're saying? It's like I'm, I wonder what the statistics are, were, are as far as uh, the, the recidivism rate back in the, the, day, the day and age of the revolving door as opposed to after that, maybe mid, like mid nineties when nobody was getting making parole or, you know, and after, you know, in, in the day and age of, 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 uh, uh, whenever, uh, uh, parole was more, much more difficult to have. Did people, did more people that got out, uh, reoffend or did here are some, do, do, do more people reoffend now as well, opposed to back then? Well, here are some statistics I can throw at you that will that can help explain and that I do know off the top of my head. 70%, about it's around 70 to 80% of people who get out of prison will within 3 years, within 3 to 10 years. So I think it's within 3 years it's 70%, within 10 years it's going on 90%. Um so of so within that range 70% uh, of prisoner or, or ex felons will reoffend in that time. Okay. So, what, so that sounds like less people are reoffending when they get out. But here's, but the point is, is that mo everyone in their lifetime commits crimes. The biggest determination, determination of crime, of someone who commits crime, 
is age. So generally, people commit crime of all types, whether that's speeding or or, or murder or um, or uh, you know embezzling. People do that when they're younger. All right, especially the the, the peak is between eighteen and thirty five. All right, so that's the peak of when people do that. So when people are getting out of prison, when they're in their their late thirties and forties and stuff like that. The crime rate should be dropping down because they should be aging out. That's why they increasingly want to lock people up more. But when people are getting out and the the rate is still 70%, that says something. And really, there and, and you say, well, what about people who constantly reoffend? There is a certain they have they know exactly that number, and that number of people who constantly reoffend, constantly are are, are a very dangerous risk to society. It's 7% of the total population. We lock up 25%. Like 25% is in at one point or another is going to be touched by uh, – by, yeah, Pretty much everybody that knows somebody is locked up. Right. So – If not directly related to them or they are them themselves. Yeah. So so the, we're, we're way – over policing this thing. And that's what goes what drives me back to we're going the wrong way. We're locking up way more like we're instead of letting the, you know, for we're letting instead of letting uh, you know, a hundred guilty men go for every innocent man, we're letting we're getting we're going way off in the other direction. And and that's also why I'm saying that you're more likely to reoffend because most people aren't going to offend at all once they hit a certain age bracket. And this is regardless of how much money they make, what race they are, where they live. None of those matter. When criminologists study that, those don't matter. The only thing that matters is age. When you're in that 18 to 35 range, you're the highest at risk. Now there's that 7% that you can it doesn't matter it just doesn't matter they just want to they want to deviate from the norm those are the people who we need to figure out how 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 do we incorporate them in society how do we do with it but i will tell you this a lifetime in treatment versus a lifetime in prison are two totally different things a lifetime in treatment is a lifetime in treatment is unfortunate, but a lifetime in prison is – that is – it's beyond a punishment. You have taken away that person's life. A lifetime in treatment, the people surrounding them will try and give that person access to as much as they can. They will work with that person. They will understand what their boundaries are, and they will work – they will work not only to protect that person. They will work to protect the people around them, and they will understand. They will try and work together, but – Officers in prison, they don't care. They were trained to say that inmates are liars and that they we should not be doing anything. And they will have if you're locked up in a prison for your entire life, you have no life. It is taken away. Your family, your friends, all of it. Your opportunities gone. It's if if you were locked up um if you were locked up in the 90s and you had a life sentence, like if you were um, locked up as a teenager in the '90s, you have a life sentence, and you're you're sitting, you're still sitting in prison right now. Then you've never used a cell phone, you've never used the internet, probably, you've never used uh, like you don't know like like all of these things. You probably the only way you have access to them is as contraband being snuck into prison, which is another thing. Not only are the inmates more likely to offend. We now make the officers criminals too because they don't get paid. They get overworked. They're put in this crazy dangerous situation and to capitalize on it, the best way to do that is to once again take advantage of the inmates who will bribe them and in, in all sorts of different ways to, to try and make their lives easier, which in treatment, 
in treatment, I saw that too. I saw people try and, tr and bribe the staff. And you know what the staff said? They said no, because the reason that they were there was to help them. And they knew that if, if someone bribed them or whatever, that that was not helping them because they had a different mission for being there and they were, and they liked being there. All, all right. Before you go on too far though, let me, I got another one to hit you with. Okay. And this kind of, you, you kind of touched on this point as well, but look, let, let's, let's say look, you're right. Okay, fine. I, I, I may agree with you. Let, let's look at it from the point of view that maybe it is uh, societally better or whatever, but, what if society doesn't care? What if as a, as a majority of people that are out there, which is probably the case in Texas, I don't get, we don't care whether or not this is going to – we're not trying to help these people. These people have harmed us, and we want to hurt them back. We're angry, and we, want, we just want them to be in prison. We want them to suffer. We want, I'm glad their life is getting taken away from them. I mean, how do you argue that, against that? If, that's, if that is the desire of, of society, then – so be it. I mean, thus, thus the people have spoken, and, they, and they're the ones with the voting power. With the right, I and and that is that is there's a lot of people like that there, and I I have talked about on this show before. There's a lot of people who are they feel like certain sentences deserve they deserve what they get. My judge, he's like that. You deserve what you get, but you understand. Yeah, he didn't care. Hardships that you faced. I mean, right. Um, no, no matter how onerous it may be to have to, to uh, um, being put upon you to uh, complete your your sentence. Uh, as far as he was concerned, you know, you know, you, you, it's it's not enough, probably. Right. Well, I killed someone, so I deserve what I get, and I get, and I yeah. hear, I hear what he's saying. I I hear, and I. This is what I want. I. I, mean, I there's people out there. There's going to be families of people that have, that have been murdered, and they're angry, and 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 they're they're upset, and it's and and it is going to be extremely difficult for anybody to not see their point of view in the whole thing. And, and they're, they're like, I don't care. I don't want this person ever back in society. I don't care if he comes back. I don't care if he if he's fixed or whatever. I don't you know. Uh, I don't want him to get fixed. I just want him to hurt. I just want him to suffer like I'm suffering. And that's let's start with them. Let's start with the the victim aspect of it first. So to the victims, I want to say this is there's there's a really good analogy um, that I heard about, which was basically if it's like vegans being stuck in like in the middle of the Sahara and they've been wandering the desert and um, they're starving. They have they haven't had any water or anything, and then all of a sudden you know that. What? You know that happened to me. <laughs> yeah, happened to your ancestors. <laughs> no, it happened. No, I'm telling you, it was a hell of a story. I'll have to, I'll have to get into that right. one. Of these days. Yeah, but so, but anyway, these vegans are stuck in the middle of the desert. They haven't eaten or anything like that. All of a sudden, a hamburger stand stands there, and then all the vegans are lined up at the hamburger stand, and they're just they're mowing down, and they and then someone goes and says, "See, they like it. They love it." And that and that's exactly what our criminal justice system is right now. Is like, see, they want those people to suffer. They want it because that's all we offer them right now. That's all the only thing that we offer people who are suffering, who are hurting, who have been seriously, seriously, seriously hurt is just lock them up, make them pay, make them suffer. That's all we offer as an option. That's all they're shown. That's all they can see. We don't show them other options. And as I've said so many times, and I will, I will keep saying, I will keep saying it because it is my, it's part of my, um, it's part of what I have to live with after, after having, after having killed someone is that, um, I would have done what like it, working with the victim's family? If I had actually had, like, if it had been restorative justice, and like I've been able to work with the family and figure out what they actually needed from me and what I could help them with, and like I would have never paid my lawyer. I would have never paid to go to court. I would have never paid any of that. I would have given them all of the money. I would have, if they needed me to 
build them the casket, if they needed me to build them whatever, if they need me to do whatever, if they, I would have done anything for them, all right? Because I wronged them. I don't care about the state of Texas. That's not who I wronged. I wronged that family and his friends and the people he cared about. The state, pff, that's, that, I don't care about Texas. Now my feeling is Texas has wronged me. <laughs> and that's, and that's a whole different story. But that's, but like, but the family, the family I have forever wronged. I have forever hurt. And then because of, of this whole thing that we have, the way it's set up of like, we need to punish people as hard as humanly possible. Now there's this giant rift <laughs> and that, and there will, I don't see any way that there can be, that we could ever work back to that place where we could actually work together and figure well, it out and well, do that. Maybe, maybe you, that's something else you can hit on right now tonight. I mean, you and I both uh, have attended uh, classes that were about, uh, that were, that were put together by people who were the victims of crimes that, that decided that they wanted to go and talk to criminals because they realized that, that the, uh, the resentment and the the anger that they harbored inside toward them w was something that was actually harmful to them. It was an emotionally uh, and psychologically harmful thing, and that for them to be able to meet with them and to actually be able to come to a conclusion of forgiveness towards them was a uh, released them from a great deal of pain that they were suffering through, and and gave them a a very a new Lease on life. So possibly you could explain that uh, that aspect to it uh, through this medium, and and potentially somewhere along the lines uh, 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 that revelation may come may come about may come about to them that and to and to others. I, well, and I will say something. So he, what Malone is talking about is Bridges to Life. That we it was a program that was not part of the prison. Churches actually had to bring that, like basically force feed that down to the prison. And it's proven that one thing about Bridges Life, which I'm um, to be all fair and honestly, like I kind of am not a huge fan of it, but the idea behind it, I really like of it's bringing victims and criminals together and it's trying to get them to, to empathize with like, it tells victim stories and brings, um, and then like the victims hear the side from the, from criminals and it's incredibly, it is incredibly important. It is incredibly important that work. And what you're saying, Malone, is is something important to hit on. And then I need to hit on one more thing, and then we're going to have to wrap up soon. Um, is that is that basically they did something else outside of the system, and then they got they when they go, everyone who comes in there and tells a story. They talk about how they came in here, they told a story, they did um they they came in and they did, you know, they did this thing and then all of a sudden they got this got something from it. They got something that helped them to heal. But it wasn't they weren't getting that from just the criminal justice process. And I've heard that time and the people who I've heard it on This American Life. I've heard it in many different stories and avenues. No one says, oh, this guy got sentenced, got, he got a capital sentence and he was put on death row. And now I feel free because, you know, because I watched him die um, in front of me. It's like, no, I don't hear that story. What I hear is when they actually get to hear and they get to work together and they actually get to see the other person empathize and they understand that the person empathizes with what happened. And then they also get to hear that it wasn't just that it was just some callous mistake or just something like that, because it's generally, there's more to it. There's way more to it for everyone involved. And, and they, get, involved. what? For everyone involved. Oh, Dave Hey, is Dave back. is back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, I'll be back. <laughs> No, you won't. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Families and victims have to go outside the system to get solace anyway. And the other thing I want to point out this too, you the reason we are talking about this is like, what about people who just want criminals to pay? 
We just want them to pay. I don't care. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't want them to be rehabilitated. It's good for them. It'll teach them. It'll learn them. This is what. I don't what, care if they're or not. They don't want them to learn about anything. They just want them to hurt. And uh, it makes me feel better. Right. And for all you good Christians or whatever you are who are saying these things, um, I would. I, you I, stepped I, in it now. I know I did. I well, I say that because um, I'm coming. I'm coming from Texas, and a lot of people usually. Uh, a lot of people will preface whatever they're saying with it, that they're a good Christian, and then they say something horrible. Um, so no offense. There are, I've, I do know some really great Christians and I'm friends with them and they know themselves. They're listening to this podcast right now because they're awesome. They're awesome Christians. Those, yeah, there's a difference between awesome Christian and good Christian. So anyway, every good Christian should be listening to this podcast. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I don't know how you could possibly call yourself a good Christian. You're not listening to this podcast. If you, if you at all have any <laughs> religious beliefs at all, well, then you know. Oh, thank you for that. Certainly what, what you should be listening to. Okay. This is where you should be. <laughs> all right. So, good. Uh, so, anyway. So they they are they want people to suffer, and I say to that that you people who want want people to suffer and you think it's a great idea, you're part of the problem. You're the reason that crime is is growing instead of shrinking. Well, I mean, really, you wonder why you wonder why that um, you you sit there and you say you know this person should suffer, this person deserves what they get, blah 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 blah. They deserve whatever. And then you wonder why someone has gets it in their head. They're like, you know what? This person, he deserves to die. I'll kill them. I deserve their money. I'll take it. They deserve, you know, they deserve to be beaten. I'm going to beat them. This woman, you know, th- this person deserves to be kidnapped. I'm going to do it. Philosophical standpoint. Right. So you're basically just instilling them that you can decide all of the rules and then you if as long as it makes sense in your head then it's then it works. And the thing is that's not how that's not how morals work. Morals are they're right. They have to be right. They're a standard that we all have to live by. And you can't just say someone deserves whatever. It's it they just de- what people deserve is to be listened to. To be to be taken case by case and to be treated individually, and some and they also deserve help no matter what situation they're in and just and despite whatever bad behavior, it's just like a little kid, like if they're a little baby and they they babies do all sorts of horrible things all the time, you know. If I if a grown adult well, goes in the middle of the room and shits themselves, well, you know. <laughs> The, that's an awful thing. Babies do it all the time, and we correct them. Which is, and I don't know why we take that kind of thing. From babies. <laughs> right. Those babies have been getting away with it for years. I know. <laughs> but I can change your own diapers. Some, but we, Malone and I have both seen grown men that don't have much more men, better mentality than babies. And they think they know what everyone deserves too. So, you know what? What I say is everyone deserves some kindness and some help and some respect. And I think that's where we need to wrap up the show tonight before Dave comes in with some more women and interrupts everything again. So, um, I want to thank everyone for listening to the show. Um, If you want an awesome hoodie, like a shakedown hoodie like this, you can always go to waywardpress.com and get uh, an awesome shakedown hoodie. And um, and then uh, Malone and I will be at Fan Expo in Denver and um, hopefully doing some more panels this year. Hopefully we'll be doing a bunch of awesome comic-related panels this year. And uh, right. Yeah, and more. But what would you like to say, Malone, before we go, before oh, we wrap I this? Know, I didn't have- I had nothing to say other than, you know. Uh, beautiful person. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, what Asian would you like Dave to say? He's a beautiful person. I would like to say that 
Although it has been a very frustrating day, I apologize for not being more available to podcast today. But, you know, you're beautiful people. Well, and we'd like to thank Dave for the use of his microphone that actually works. <laughs> so I've never sounded better. And my dog. Oh, and, and, just... and um, the lovely Nina, my soulmate. Come here, come here. Hold on. You okay. heard it here first, folks. Uh, say hi to uh, Nina. Oh, Nina. All right. Nina. We just got a whole new fan base. Thank you. for you got, We got the dog fan base, the cute puppy fan base. So. Yeah. Uh, Nina's coming up. She's, calling, <laughs> she's coming up here to say hi to everybody. Hi, Nina. <laughs> Nina's going to be on the camera, girl. Nina, look. Look. Look at you. On camera. Oh, she wants to lick me. I know it. I love you too, baby. I want to lick you. This is why they're soulmates. All right, everyone. From everyone, <laughs> what's that? She drinks toilet water, and yet she likes Malone's face. Gross. Uh, I mean, gr- I Malone. have no doubts that Malone drinks toilet water too, from time to time. Uh, and prison water can't be much better, so yeah. Yeah. Fair. All Don't right. really drink toilet water, ladies. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. I had a really, really smart comment for that one, but I'll leave it alone. About the ladies, <laughs> the water. ladies, uh, ladies, d- ladies in Denver. I'm sure this will be coming up about the time that this podcast comes out. But Malone will be in Denver, and um, there you go. Yeah, so look out, I know look it's out, hard Denver. To I'm still single. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard. N- Nina's trying her best. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I may look may look like a hobo. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And with that, everyone, thanks. Thank you, everyone, from the Shakedown, and good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. The Shakedown was produced at Longmont Public Media, and our theme song, Shakedown, was brought to you by Envato Elements. If you want any Shakedown merchandise, or you want to support the show you can go to waywordpress.com. That's W-A-Y-W-O-R-D press.com.